Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have uh, Kurshid Koja, who is a uh, fellow who knows a lot about the legal side of uh, the uh, cannabis industry, and that's what it is now. He's the founder of Green Bridge Corporate Council, and uh, advising people who are involved in the cannabis industry is your major uh, legal practice. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Good also, enjoy. we have... Uh, we have Roberto Leibman, who is, is a uh, software engineer at uh, 42 Lines. Correct. And we welcome you to the show. Welcome back after a, a, a long absence. We, we, uh, we've missed you. Thank you. So thank you for coming back. Uh, Kurshid, the uh, recreational use of marijuana in California is legal in California mm -hmm. and eight other states. Medical use is legal in California and 28 other states at my last count. And uh, limited THC marijuana is legal or at least decriminalized. Yeah, I think all of the states except for four. Uh, so uh, we have a, a conundrum because, of course, at the federal level, marijuana is illegal under, uh, it's called a, a, a Section 1, uh, no medical use, no legal use whatsoever. Uh, substance is right up there with heroin and, and, and some of the worst uh, of drugs. Correct. And, of course, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions in his infinite wisdom, has decided to uh, rescind the Cole Amendment, or a memorandum, and uh, give uh, federal prosecutors in the Justice Department uh, full discretionary power to prosecute uh, any kind of marijuana case that they want to, whenever they want to, wherever they want to, legal in this, at the state level or not. Uh, where, does, where does that put you uh, in terms of giving legal advice to people who are doing uh, doing everything legally according to California or Oregon or Colorado law. Sure. Uh, well, um, since I started in this practice, my uh, one of my touchstones has been uh, when I speak to clients, uh, the first thing I tell them is, look, what you're doing is still federally illegal. Uh, there's no way around that. Uh, and I cannot advise you on how to uh, skirt the law or uh, there's really no way to mitigate your exposure under federal law. It's illegal under the Controlled Substances Act. It's still Schedule One. Um, the best defense that you've got is to follow state and local laws. So if state and local laws say that you need a business license, uh, then you need a business license. If state and local law says you need to pay certain taxes, you need to pay those taxes. Um, if they say that you have to uh, abide by certain land use rules, then you have to abide by, abide by those land use rules. And that's really the only way that you can um, mitigate any potential exposure that you might have from a federal prosecution. And so that advice hasn't really changed um, over the years. That's pretty much been the same. Uh, even with the Cole Memo in place, the Cole Memo didn't have the force of law. Cole Memo is merely an executive uh, agency memo. It's guidance to the um, U.S. attorneys in local, in local jurisdictions. Um, the only real federal law that we've got, and we still have it, thankfully, uh, at least until March 23rd when the continuing resolution uh, ends, uh, we've got a budget writer that essentially tells the uh, DEA and the DOJ that they cannot spend uh, federal money going after um, uh, actors who are abiding by lo state and local law and operating licensed, tax-paying, regulated businesses uh, in states where that's legal to do. You know um, about the Rohrabacher Farr? Uh, that's right. That's the Rohrabacher Farr Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going, uh, if, if it's renewed, it'll be uh, called the Rohrabacher Blumenauer Amendment. Uh, that protects medical cannabis. Now, uh, adult use cannabis, uh, which is legal in eight states, is not necessarily protected by that. Um, for that, we've got um, the Polis Amendment, which is essentially the corollary to uh, Rohrabacher Farr, Rohrabacher Blumenauer, that says, DEA, DOJ can't spend money on prosecuting legal operators in recreational or adult use states. So does that mean that uh, federal prosecutors uh, of the mind to prosecute on marijuana are biding their time until March in hopes that the uh, the uh, that it's not it's not re uh, renewed? Well, it's it's possible that there may be some folks who are who are waiting for um, the purse strings to be untied and for them to spend that money on prosecutions. However, um, in reaction to uh, Attorney General Sessions' announcement about the Cole Memo. Uh, there were a number of U.S. attorneys that came out and, and um, uh, published statements uh, either supporting or saying, hey, there's really no change uh, in the way that we prosecute uh, cannabis cases. And so, for example, in Boston, where you do have legal adult use and medical, um, the U.S. attorney there was quite um, aggressive uh, in, in, in his support of 
the um, uh, of AG Sessions and and the prohibition against federal prohibition against cannabis. And so, so he's going to prosecute. Well, that that that's the indication that that he gave in, in mm -hmm. his statement. Now, when you go to you look at the U.S. Attorney for Colorado, however. Um, the U.S. Attorney for Colorado said the opposite, essentially, and said, well, there's really no change. We're going to continue to work with uh, state and local law enforcement, our partners in state, state and local law enforcement, uh, which to me means that they are really just going to go after the bad actors. So to the extent that there are still black market operators uh, in those states, folks who are, are unlicensed or are skirting the law, um, those folks are going to be fair game. But if you are licensed, paying your taxes, complying with state and local law, um, the indication is, at least in that jurisdiction, that the U.S. attorney is not inclined to prosecute. Um, so we've had a number of, um, of U.S. attorneys in different jurisdictions uh, taking a position one way or the other, most of them saying, hey, we're going to continue to operate um, in conjunction with our state and local partners in law enforcement, and we're going to go after the worst elements. Um, this is not necessarily open season on everybody. What's the situation in California? Uh, the situation in California is mixed. We've had um, some, to the extent that U.S. attorneys in, in California have said anything, generally they're saying, well, we're going to continue to work with our state and local law enforcement uh, to determine who, you know, what are the biggest threats to public safety uh, and where we need to focus our resources. Now, you know, the, the um, amount of money that the U.S. Attorney's Office has to prosecute these cases is already very limited. Uh, and so they've got very limited budgets to go after these types of prosecutions. <coughs> They're also living in a state that has voted overwhelmingly to support uh, medical cannabis and uh, to support adult use cannabis now for all uh, adults over 21. So they'd have an awfully hard time finding a jury uh, <coughs> that would support them. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can't cause mischief. That doesn't mean that they can't, uh, with the cost of a postage stamp, essentially chill the entire market by saying, you know, sending, landlord, sending letters to landlords, for example, as they did during the last crackdown and saying, hey, you've got somebody operating a cannabis business on your property. If you don't want to use your, lose your property under uh, civil asset forfeiture laws, uh, you'd better kick them out. Um, and so, you know, we could, we could see a spur of letters go out to landlords like we did the last, uh, during the last crackdown. Um, or we could see, again, uh, folks just sort of going after bad actors and finding folks in the black market who continue to operate and focusing enforcement efforts against them. What's the uh, possibility? Go ahead. Uh, how else is uh, the discrimination uh, of your clients by the federal government be, be, uh, affected them? For instance, can they get legal insurance? Can they get... That's a great question. Um, so one of the biggest issues right now uh, in the cannabis industry is banking access. Banking access, um, of So yeah. a lot of these businesses... Um, uh, are not able to get bank accounts uh, if they're if they go into a bank branch and they are honest about what they do most banks will say sorry we can't bank you uh, because that would be a violation of federal anti-money laundering laws mm -hmm. um, you know the trade in any kind of controlled substance is call is a specified and lawful activity under the bank secrecy act uh, and so therefore if you go in and try to deposit those funds um, the bank who is following anti-money laundering laws bank secrecy act usa patriot act uh, is going to say, we can't take those funds and we cannot bank your funds here and you can't have an account here. Uh, so the folks in the industry who do have uh, banking access are either working with a bank that is quietly doing that business and complying with the FinCEN guidance that was put out, the guidance put out by the Department of Treasury uh, in 2013 on how to bank those funds, uh, or they are banking under false pretenses and telling them uh, we're, we're a flower shop or it's we a are... A, yeah, um, you know, and so, uh, or they are uh, dealing in cash, which is extremely dangerous uh, from a public safety situation. It, 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 it's it's uh, um, anytime they go to pay their taxes, for example, um, you know, they can't just write a check. Uh, they have to go, you know, put a backpack full of cash on their back and go to the taxing authority and make that payment in cash, which is. Wow. Um, very nerve-wracking, uh, as you can imagine, and uh, there have been robberies. There have been um, um, uh, vi there has been you know there have been violent incidents uh, with folks who are uh, just trying to pay their taxes or trying to pay other bills in cash uh, because folks know that they can't have banking access, and so they're targeted for that reason. And um, the uh, the uh, I've heard there are some efforts by some uh, growers uh, and uh, people in the industry. <coughs> to set up their own uh, banking system that would be uh, willing to uh, work with uh, the cannabis industry. Is that, is that going anywhere? That's, um, so there are a few efforts going on right now. I, I served on the State Treasurer's Cannabis Banking Working Group, uh, and so one of the things that uh, we 
uh, did after about a, hearing a year uh, or so of testimony from various folks in the industry, from the financial sector, uh, from state and local government, uh, was we, we um, issued a report, and one of the things that we recommended in the report uh, was that we do a feasibility study of a uh, public bank uh, in California or uh, some sort of banking institution that was outside of the federal system that would be able to serve the cannabis industry and other underbanked uh, industries and, and communities as well. So um, that um, there is currently a uh, request for information out uh, by the uh, state treasurer's office and the AG's office. Um, they are looking for referrals to folks who can actually do a feasibility study and determine whether or not we can set up a, an independent banking institution. Um, there are other um, folks in the industry in Colorado. Uh, I have a good friend uh, um, who is part of the um, uh, Fourth Corner Credit Union. They uh, were just approved for a master account from the Fed. Um, and their express purpose is to provide banking to the cannabis industry. And mm -hmm. so that seems to be moving forward. Um, so there is some movement, uh, but you know, big swaths of the industry are still unbanked and we still have that problem of all that cash on the streets. What is the, uh, the local regulatory climate for uh, the, the industry? I know that each city, each county, each jurisdiction uh, sets up their own uh, rules and regs. How, right. how is that playing out? Is that, is that leading to a, a, a wide variety of regulatory enforcement and so forth? So the way our, our state <coughs> regulations are set up, you need to have local permission in order to operate and get a state license. And so you do have state regulation and licensing uh, throughout the state and every different um, city and, and county takes a different position, right? So and there everybody are some, wants a cut. That's right, and everybody wants, wants their cut. Uh, so unless they're banning it outright and saying we don't want it at all, uh, they and they, are, and they have the uh, ability to do that? And they do have the ability to do that under, under state law. They can say we don't want this at all. Uh, and no one can force them to, to take those businesses and license or regulate them. Uh, there are other jurisdictions that are um, uh, essentially rolling out the red carpet and saying, hey, we welcome this industry into our jurisdiction. We want the jobs, we want the tax revenue, uh, and we want, you know, we want this to be a safe regulated market, not a black market in our, our jurisdiction. And so Sacramento, for example, a lot of the Bay Area jurisdictions, San Francisco, Oakland, mm -hmm. um, uh, Los Angeles uh, as well in the South, there are, are numerous jurisdictions that have essentially said we want to uh, have this industry as part of our community. Uh, and then there are those in between who are in, either in process uh, and have started to regulate and started to build licensing regimes and said, well, we want certain types of businesses, but not others. Uh, so they may not want dispensaries, storefront dispensaries, but they may be okay with a distribution warehouse, which doesn't have a pub public facing, um, uh, you know, doesn't have a public facing function, doesn't have foot traffic or, or uh, the same types of, uh, of uh, land use consequences as a, a storefront dispensary. Um, so uh, there are you know, 20 um, plus licenses in the cannabis industry that you can get at the state level. Um, you know, there's manufacturing, cultivation, distribution, uh, retail, delivery, testing, um, and uh, each of those all have different variants uh, as well. What's the, uh, the, uh, the tax cut uh, on average uh, across California? Uh, so in other words, is, it, uh, is, is there room for the black market to continue to uh, uh, thrive by uh, uh, operating untaxed? Uh, absolutely. Um, so at the state level, we have a cultivation tax of uh, $9.25 uh, per, uh, per ounce, uh, and we've got a um, cultivation, I'm sorry, a, uh, an excise tax um, of 15% uh, as well that is charged on the purchase, uh, retail purchase of cannabis. Um, and then that's, that's aside from state sales tax uh, as well. So you've got state, state, wow. state sales tax, you've got the excise tax, you've got the cultivation tax. Uh, and then you've got local taxation as well. And so many jurisdictions, so for example, Oakland, um, there's a 5% gross receipts tax on medical uh, businesses and a 10% gross receipts tax on uh, adult use cannabis businesses. I'm trying to add this up in my head. Back, back in the day when I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, smoking Wisconsin green, uh, it was, uh, I think, 5 or $10 an ounce for, for, the, for, the, for the plant. That's, yeah. that's just a tax now. And that's just the tax now. So what, what does an ounce cost these days? 
Um, you know, that's, Legal, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, um, you know, I, I, it, it varies obviously by the grade of, uh, of what you're buying, but right. uh, uh, I have already heard from consumers saying, hey, uh, you know, I went in and spent uh, 150 bucks and all I got was uh, an eighth and uh, a cartridge uh, of oil. Um, and that was significantly more than, you know, what I expected to spend. Um, so you're already seeing um, some of that um, uh, pain at the consumer level and uh, to the extent that they have access to black market providers, um, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion that they won't go there. Um, you know, we uh, passed um, legalization on the assumption that folks would want to go to a clean storefront mm -hmm. um, and be in a safe situation and buy regulated product that's been tested, uh, that they know is what they the say, what everything. the proprietor says it is. Um, and, uh, and I think that still holds true, but um, the, the tax burden is definitely making it harder on consumers to make that choice. Um, and our, our regulators are keenly aware of that. I think at least at the state level, they're keenly aware that if you over-regulate, over-tax, you are giving air, giving oxygen to the black market. So they, they've actually heard of the Laffer Curve, which says that uh, if you tax something 100%, you're not going to get any of it. <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me because, because uh, uh, I mean, obviously the black, the black market is going to happen anytime you have such a, such a ridiculous amount of, of tax. However, I think as a libertarian, something that fascinates me is the fact that we won the war. The war on drugs, at least in marijuana, yeah. had we won it. And that's just amazing and I, and I feel great about it because, you know, it, it took us, what, since Nixon, 30 years? No, since uh, Anslinger back in the '30s. Exactly. Yeah. So, so um, with all of the all of the all of the racism that went into into marijuana, how is the uh, how are how is the the other fronts of the war from your perspective? Well, how is that uh, going? Uh, when you talk about about things that that have potential medical uses, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not going to talk about heroin, but maybe you know LSD and LSD, and, 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 uh, MDMA, PCD, yeah, exactly. uh, psilocybin. Those right. are all things that have therapeutic uses, mm -hmm. um, and while I, I you know, have not uh, studied that as in-depth, I, I do know that work is moving ahead um, and that the DEA has been a lot more flexible with those substances in terms of their therapeutic uses and, and allowing uh, some additional study and, and uh, work to be done uh, on those fronts. Um, um, I believe that those are Schedule One. Oh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, the, LSD I mean, is, um, sir, yeah. Sir, they're, but they're, I mean, they're, they're working with, um, uh, substances in addition to LSD, MDMA, psilocybin, other things that have potential uh, medical use um, that are not necessarily Schedule One, but are still scheduled under the Controlled mm -hmm. Substances Act. So um, I don't know if that means that the DEA has uh, has learned uh, from the experience of cannabis that uh, they can't uh, really stand in the way. But um, I'm not so sure that we've entirely won yet. I think we've won at the state level for sure. I, 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 th um, I think what you see, what we're, I mean, obviously they're still fighting. Right. But you know there was fighting after the armistice. There was still fighting, right? Yeah. In, in World War One. So that's how I see it. It's like, yeah, there there are still be I, people. I lived, I lived in Texas in the in the eighties, and uh. they're still fighting the prohibition. Right, uh, right, right. Exa so, exa exactly, well, exactly. 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 There I, are still prohibitionists yeah, uh, yeah. in this country. Yeah. You know that's been. It's been there there are still years. dry counties in Texas. Right. Exactly. To this day. Exactly. I, I like to remind people that the first cannabis industry wasn't the cannabis industry that we work in, it was the prohibition okay. industry, well, okay, right? Yeah, it yeah. was, it's the folks who are profiting on uh, prohibition right. and um, locking people up and, you know, treating them for drug addiction, uh, doing other well, things. Well, yeah, and, I mean, the people who profited from drugs being illegal are prison guards, cops, right. uh, medical, you know, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. and, and, uh, uh, and, and the the justice system uh, keeps yeah. busy that way too. That's right, and they want to hold on to that revenue stream, right? Yeah. So they're not. Oh, so it's, so it's a matter of revenue and power. So because, right. well, because are, we, are we reaching a fulcrum? Are we reaching a, a tipping point where the where the tax money brought in by marijuana is greater than the civil asset forfeiture money and, and so forth that's brought in by keeping it illegal? What, what, why did you can have both? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're looking for that. When, when the government when the government can take it, they'll do it. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the same folks who are taxing aren't necessarily taking the civil asset forfeiture money, too, right? So right. the civil asset forfeiture money is going to uh, local and federal law enforcement uh, who may not necessarily be benefiting from the tax revenue generated at the state and local level right. by these cannabis businesses. Yeah, right. um, the uh, suit by Alexis Bortelis is interesting to me. He's a 12-year-old, uses medical marijuana, 
Uh, she, along with four other plaintiffs, plaintiffs including a, a veteran and a retired football player, are suing Jeff, Jeff Sessions uh, uh, to, to get uh, marijuana off of Schedule 1. Mm -hmm. Is this something that's going to have legs, or is it going to be uh, thrown out of court just like every other suit like it? Well, so it's not going to be thrown out of court necessarily. They, they had uh, hearings on Valentine's Day, and um, the initial coverage that um, I, I've read is that the, um, the judge in that case has said essentially, look, you know, it's hard to believe that there isn't a medical use for cannabis at the same time. Um, the plaintiffs really should be taking this to the DEA and taking this in front of an administrative law judge. And that's been the federal government's argument as well is that, hey, you can't start here. You have to start before the DEA and petition the DEA uh, to uh, deschedule or reschedule cannabis. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> Um, to, to reschedule or deschedule cannabis, that, that starts with the DEA, starts with an administrative law judge, and that's where you have to go. Uh, now, you know, they say this, it's very disingenuous because we've tried this before. Well, um, they've all, the, the DEA has already uh, turned down those that, kinds that's of That's right. Things. So the, the, uh, the National Organization for the Reformation of Marijuana, Marijuana Laws uh, filed uh, such a petition before the DEA in, in 1972, and it wasn't actually heard until about 1988, about three, you know, 30 years ago. Um, roughly. Um, and essentially, even the DEA's own administrative law judge said, um, this is one of the safest therapeutic substances known to man. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't believe that this is Schedule 1. Um, and of course, the DEA administrator who got that, uh, that holding from the uh, administrative law judge basically crumbled it up and, and threw it out. Um, and the uh, circuit courts and the federal courts have upheld the authority of the DEA administrator to do just that. Um, and so when the federal government says, well, you've got to start in front of the DEA, um, it's being really disingenuous because that they know that that's a very politicized uh, process and it's not going to go anywhere. So um, I'm not so sure that, it, um, that we're <coughs> going to have the outcome that uh, folks are hoping to get uh, from that case, although it's certainly great to have that again in front of the public uh, for them to know that, hey, you know, look, there, there's no uh, debate about medical use. It, it's there. If the judge doesn't uh, throw it out, I mean, the, the federal government is, uh, has uh, uh, filed a motion to get it thrown out of court, essentially. If the, if the judge allows the case to continue, is that a, a case that will be heard in front of a jury? Um, that is a great question. Um, I, uh, I believe so. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they are trying to do a uh, case without a jury. I'm not a litigator, so I don't know the ins and outs of, uh, of uh, federal procedure in court. But um, I would imagine that they would want to have a jury there uh, and that uh, folks would be a lot more sympathetic um, to arguments today than they were, you know, say, 30 years ago. We're, we're at a time when I think it's 64 percent of the public is in favor of marijuana being legal for both medical and recreational use, that's the public in general. Even the majority of Republicans, uh, of right. conservatives, are in favor of marijuana being legal. Uh, and it, other uh, dangerous, so-called dangerous drugs are not uh, that far behind. Wouldn't it be easier, in a global sense, just to legalize everything, let the chips fall where they may? Uh, I, as a libertarian, I hate to say tax it, but uh, that would probably be part of the, uh, of the, of the scenario. Wouldn't that be a lot easier? Uh, I, I think it would. Uh, obviously, I, I don't think that anyone should be criminalized for what they put in their body voluntarily. Um, I think you know we're we're all grown ups, and we should be able to do what we want with our bodies. If if uh, if there's a problem, uh, we treat it like a healthcare problem, mm -hmm. um, and so that's what other countries have done. Uh, so when you look at uh, Spain, Portugal, Portugal, mm -hmm. um, Portugal decriminalized uh, uh, all drugs. Uh, at this point, including heroin. Yeah, I think it's been yeah. it's been like maybe twenty years at this point. Okay. Um, it's Four, been it's uh, been a long time. Yeah. Uh, and they've they've treated it as a healthcare issue, and uh, they've had success with that that effort. Um, and no, no higher addiction rate than, nope. or probably a lower addiction rate than right. in, the, in the states. That's right. Uh, and no, none of the, none of the uh, corollary crime that goes along with drugs being illegal, like That's the, right. the black market related crime. Can, can I ask you a, a legal question I've always had as a, as a lawyer? Um, uh, why does it take uh, a constitutional amendment to make alcohol illegal, and not a constitutional amendment to make other drugs illegal? Uh, that, that's a... Uh, Great question. So, um, you're asking why uh, why we would need the um, uh, so we're, we're talking about prohibition, prohibition obviously, right, yes. alcohol prohibition. Yeah. So, so it takes a, it takes a, a constitutional amendment to make alcohol illegal, but yet 
uh, marijuana and other drugs can be, can be regulated. I, I'm not so sure that we absolutely needed to have a constitutional amendment to make alcohol illegal. I think that's the way that um, it developed. Uh, I think we, you know, prior to having a constitutional amendment, you had at, at various state levels, you had states that, that went dry uh, mm -hmm. before prohibition mm -hmm. was passed at the federal level. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, we needed a constitutional amendment to repeal prohibition right. because we had a constitutional amendment to of make course. it illegal in the first place. Um, so, you know, with, um, with all other drugs, that's not the way we've gone. So we've had essentially uh, the Congress and uh, the executive passed the Controlled Substances Act uh, in, in 72. Um, and, um, you know, it, it didn't, did, they did not employ a constitutional uh, amendment to do so. So um, interesting question. I, I don't know if they if they'd had the opportunity, if they'd had the ability to do that, maybe they would have. But uh, well, I think I, I think it's part part of it is the over overreach of the of the uh, interstate commerce clause that that really started being used uh, way after prohibition. That that probably made it so. Uh, so it was a well, well, speaking of, of congressional action, I mean, con Congress has the ability and the uh, uh, capability of uh, saying anytime they want to that. Uh, uh, Marijuana is no longer Schedule One, or That's right. no drug is Schedule One. We're getting rid of the, you know, the we're schedules. repealing the entire, uh, sub, uh, you know, the entire all, all of the drug laws. Yeah, we, are we moving in that direction? Will, will, will congressmen get the cojones to actually do what the people want? I, I don't know that we're going to get there anytime soon. Um, I think, um, you know, with respect to cannabis, though, uh, what we've seen in terms of the congressional reaction to the Sessions announcement. Uh, we've got Republican uh, senators saying, hey, uh, we're going to sit on your uh, appointments to the DOJ uh, until you decide to uh, make a change. Now, um, uh, that, that blockade, if you will, by uh, Senator Cory Gardner from Colorado, uh, who's a Republican who did not support legalization, uh, but yet took a stand in favor of states' rights and, and uh, the rights of his state um, uh, to, to engage in this experiment. Um, I know that uh, they've had discussions, uh, and they, uh, he has since lifted that, that blockade, and so some of those appointments are moving forward. But um, the fact that we've seen so many uh, on both sides of the aisle um, in Congress, Democrats and Republicans, say, hey, this doesn't make any sense, this is not right, um, is encouraging. And that's not something that would have happened five years ago. One more question, just a few seconds left. Uh, President Trump, uh, when he was on the campaign trail, said uh, that he thought marijuana should be a state's rights issue. That's right. Uh, very explicit. Medical marijuana. Medical yeah. marijuana. Yeah. Well, though, I, like he said and, then and what and, he says and, now. Uh, and he's not been shy about uh, operating uh, Jeff Sessions on other issues. Why not on this issue? That is a great question. Um, I, you know, um, I'm, I'm uh, on the board of a national trade association that does have lobbyists in Washington, and, and what we learned about the Sessions announcement is that he did not clue in anyone in the administration before taking that move. So, so. He, he was a acting as the Lone Ranger. That's right. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much, Roberto. Thank you. And uh, uh, I appreciate for being on the show. That was fascinating. Thank you.